this week on the Backtable Podcast. I think for people that want to do PA in the OBL, I'd probably cut my teeth on it in the hospital if you have that opportunity. So if you can treat your first 10 or 20 patients on a machine, maybe a fixed unit that has navigation capabilities in cone beam, I think that would serve you well and then take those skills that you've learned in the hospital and migrate them into the OBL. You can start doing these in the OBL. I think it's very safe. It just may take you a little bit longer to identify the vessels, especially if you don't have a breadth of knowledge of doing a couple hundred cases. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. First, a brief word from our sponsors. Embracing innovation, enhancing outcomes. Greetings to our esteemed IR community. Today's podcast is proudly sponsored by Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company. Picture a future where cutting edge interventional technologies are seamlessly integrated with world-class imaging tools that are designed to reshape procedural efficiency, enhance precision, and foster patient-centered care and interventional radiology. Because that's our vision at Varian, and we're working with partners across Siemens Health and Ears to bring it to life. At Varian, we are in hot pursuit of efficiency and superior outcomes. Our evolving portfolio is reshaping ablation and embolization procedures with tools that offer intuitive, unique capabilities. Imagine a world without fear of cancer, where Varian solutions empower you to deliver individualized, high-quality treatments. Solutions like Embazine and Oncazine are a line of precisely calibrated microspheres designed to enable super-selective, targeted embolization. What sets our Embazine and Oncazine microspheres apart? Features that enhance procedural and cost efficiency, like precise calibration and syringes that contain more microspheres per volume, which means fewer syringes per procedure, an innovation that aligns seamlessly with Varian's commitment to efficiency. And Embazine microspheres offer a broad spectrum of 10 sizes, each identified by distinctive colors, facilitating swift and precise visualization of suspension. This streamlines the process and also minimizes the potential for errors. So experience the future of interventional radiology with Varian. Check out our innovative solutions at varian.com interventional. Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company, we pioneer breakthroughs in healthcare for everyone, everywhere, sustainably. Now, back to the show. This is Michael Barraza is your host. I'm joined today by Dr. Charlie Nutting, endovascular consultants of Colorado, and we're going to be talking about prostatic artery embolization, PAE, in the OBL. Charlie, thanks for joining us. Yeah, Michael, thanks for having me. I want to talk about your OBL specifically and talking about doing PAE in your OBL. One of the things I wanted to ask you about first, one thing that people have been excited about are the new American Urological Association guidelines, which have included PAE in their recommendations. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it is. And yeah, I know it's been a lot of work by a lot of people, yourself included. Well, it's been a long time coming, Michael, and super excited to have PAE in the 2023 guideline revision by the AUA. And we've really been fighting an uphill battle for the last 15 years. And going from the first prostate embolization done in the year 2000 by Dr. Demerit for hematuria. And then there were animal studies that were ongoing in the late 2000s in Portugal and Brazil, followed by clinical patient trials. So really, it's been a 15-year grind to try and get PAE to the forefront and in the guidelines of some of these societies. For somebody like you, as you're an early adopter of PAE and you've got an established practice where that's a large part of it, it may not have as much of a direct impact, but for me, this actually may be very impactful to my practice. I have struggled from day one to get local urologists on board, both where I am now and where I practiced previously. And for some of them, the fact that it wasn't in the AUA guidelines was kind of used as a reason not to do it, whether that was an excuse not to send them or, or whether that was something that was really important to them. Either way, I mean, having that in there for me, I think is going to help me locally as where I am now, most of my PAE patients are self-referred. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that it's really going to bring PAE to the forefront to have it in the urologic guidelines. I think that urologists are probably now going to have to talk about PAE as an alternative to some of the minimally invasive surgical therapies. So that makes it easier for you 
to bring the guidelines to them and say, you know, this is what we're looking at for prostate artery embolization. PAE may not be for all patients, but you could work locally with your urologist to figure out that best patient population. And even for people who have done this a long time, it's I think it's going to be very helpful with the insurance denials, with the appeals, and maybe getting it bumped up on their algorithm to not be just denied from the beginning. Not experimental anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, my local urologists have recently told me, I mean, they'll admit that they have patients that come to their clinic and ask, like, tell me about this PAE thing, the prostatic artery immobilization. And it's harder for them to shoot it down at this point. Agreed. And I tell you, some of my angriest patients are the ones that come in to find me that weren't told about prostate embolization from their urologist. So they might have seen a TV commercial or done some research on their own on the internet and find that there's this minimally invasive alternative that doesn't require going through the penis, that there's no sexual dysfunction, and that the outcomes are similar to missed therapies such as TERP. So they wonder why they weren't told about that as they were going through the due diligence. I'm hopeful that it makes it easier for patients to find this as an option now. As I said, most of mine are self-referred, and, and the way they find me is that they'll hear about it somewhere, and then they'll Google prostatic artery embolization Baton Rouge, and it directs them to me. And I'm, I'm hopeful now when patients search treatment options for BPH or LUTs, then they can find it on the AUA website or something similar. Yeah. And there's this whole group of men that they call the silent sufferers that are really just sitting at home. They don't go to the urologist. 50% of men, 5-0, don't go to the urologist because they know what they're going to do to them. So you're right. These patients either go to primary care physicians or they try to manage the lower urinary tract symptoms on their own. I think bringing this procedure to the forefront when they realize nothing's going to be put in the penis or the rectum, it's an outpatient procedure, helps 90% of men with a very low risk profile, I think that patient population would be much more interested in a prostate artery embolization than they would some of these more invasive surgical therapies. And it may bring them out of the woodwork to get treated. You know, you bring up a very good point that a lot of these patients are are managed by their primary care physicians. And when you think about it, the the fact that this is in the guidelines now may actually have a, a very large impact on their primary care physicians. They're not the ones that are picking these therapies, but I think that that might go a long way with, certainly with mine. It's something that I am going to pass along to the ones I work with. Yeah. And I'm in private practice and I could tell you that maybe five to 10% of my patients are actually referred from urologists. The vast majority of them are coming either self-referred through primary care. Now they, most of them have seen a urologist at some point in their medical history, but again, the medications aren't so great just with the side effect profile of a tamsulosin or finasteride. And again, if you take those medications, you have to take them for the rest of your life. So there may be some role for PAE or other missed therapies to get patients off these lifelong medications. Charlie, I want to hear a little bit about your practice because your OBL, at least from what I know of it, seems pretty unique. How long have you been with, you guys call yourselves ECHO? We are. We're uh, ECHO Medical in Denver, Colorado. And my experience is I've been an interventional radiologist for 25 years. I've been involved in very large groups with IR subsections. And about five years ago, I just decided to kind of break off from the larger radiology group. I really wanted to focus on patient care. And honestly, at this point in my career, the nights, the weekends were just killers. So if I can focus working regular, normal business hours four or five days a week. I think it extends my career by probably a decade because I love what I do, but I just didn't have the bandwidth to do call anymore. No, no call. And it's probably nice to focus on the things that you want to do. Well, that's the beauty of the OBL is I really have a practice within a practice and my practice is embolization. So I focus on liver embolization, knee embolization, and prostate embolization. I probably do about 150 to 200 prostate embolizations a year right now. And it's almost like the kyphoplasty patients that we treat, that these patients are so thankful, maybe not right after the procedure, because they're going to be miserable for about a week afterwards. But I could tell you 90 plus percent of the patients that I do follow-ups with and do IPSS and quality of life scoring are very happy with the results of the PAE procedure. So it's just a very thankful patient population. And I just, I really believe in PAE. I think it's a great minimally invasive alternative. 
So do I. And, you know, it's something that it was not something that I, it was really pretty new when I just finished training. And so it's not something that I really saw much of in training. And once the literature started to build, I just I looked at this as like, this looks like a game changer. And so the way I learned it was I read everything. And back when Sonny Bagland and Ari Isaacson were both in North Carolina, I called Ari. I asked somebody to like, put me in touch with them. I was like, can I just come watch a few? And so I set up a day where I could go and watch him do it. And then I was hooked and then I went to stream and just picked up everything from there. But you started this a lot earlier than I did. How did you learn this when it was really new? I've always been interested in, I would say, sophisticated interventional procedures before they come mainstream so that you get to become an expert before everybody else is doing them. And I think it was a lot of the Y90 guys early on that had the good microcatheter skills and understanding of the anatomy, maybe not in the pelvis, but of complex anatomy. And I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Carnavale. I since went to train with Dr. Pisco, spent time with Ari and Sonny. I really wanted to become an expert. And it's interesting because when you look at the guidelines, the guidelines out of Europe, that in 2018, it was the UK rope study, NICE included PAE in the guidelines for the NHS in 2018. But what they said is that it should be done, at least patient selection should be done in collaboration with a urologist, and the procedure should be performed by a specialized interventional radiologist with training in prostate embolization. And when you look at the 2023 guidelines by the AUA, they kind of say the same thing, that PAE is a reasonable alternative, but should be performed by an experienced interventional radiologist. And the interesting thing is there's no real definition of what is an experienced interventional radiologist in PAE. Is that five cases, 20 cases, 100 cases? Is it going to stream Sir Cersei to, to learn the procedure? Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that later. Okay. We have physicians come in for that training as well as, I would say, a show site for Varian with a PAE training course and embolization. So I learned it early on. I think I got good at it after about 200, 300 procedures. I mean, you always are learning, right? It's one of those things that anatomy is very different. Liver anatomy is very easy compared to pelvic prostate anatomy. And you just got to kind of go slow, pick through it. I think cone beam and navigation helps you sort out some of these structures. But there are people that do it all the time on a C-arm who are very experienced. I think maybe early in your learning, it's probably worth doing it on a cone beam system with navigation. Then you, you can translate those skills onto a C-arm. And, and now there's C-arms that have navigation and cone beam capabilities as well. I didn't realize that. Yes. Charlie, I have more to ask you about PA in your practice. But one thing I, I wanted to ask you is it's pretty unique to be doing liver embolizations like Y90s in an OBL. There probably are many that are doing what you do. There's not a lot, but my practice before was working with a large radiology group and we would do the patient consultations and then we would get authorization for the procedure. The referring physicians didn't really care where the procedure was being performed. And in my experience doing it in an OBL, Yes, you have to get a RAM license to be able to treat the patients, and, and that's a, a state issue, but it doesn't take more than four to five months and is not insurmountable, and industry will help you with some of these things. But then I control the patient flow. We have a portable gamma camera that allows us to do liver-lung shunt ratio and Bremsstrahlung imaging on the back end. So I didn't want to do kind of half of a program where we were able to do inject the MAA, but then they'd have to go off-site to be able to do a scan. I wanted to be able to do it all in-house. And patient satisfaction is very high. Procedure times are low, which was seen in that Ryan Hickey paper, uh, Y90 in the OBL. You get a dedicated staff that does this stuff over and over. I would say our typical MAA procedure time is about 30 to 45 minutes. The patients get in here about 45 minutes before the procedure. We do the nuclear scan while they're recovering, put a closure device in, and they're discharged an hour later. So it really is kind of a three to four hour day for these patients. And that's about the same for the Y90 as well. It's actually a much longer day for me in the hospital setting because they have to go through the normal workflow of hospital imaging. 
Exactly. And you have, you're getting bumped by emergencies that are coming yeah. through the ER or down from the floor. So you can really control your environment much better in an OBL. Oh, I bet. I'll do my mapping and I'll be done. They'll be off the table, you know, post-closure device, 45 minutes. And I, they won't get their lung shunt study for five hours sometimes. It's like, what are we waiting for? It's frustrating for you, but can you imagine being the patient? That's what I'm saying. It actually makes perfect sense if you can get the equipment to do it in the OBL. It's a much faster and more convenient thing. Who wants to sit there all day? And I would imagine having been in the practice you were in before, I mean, you're also a well-known Y90 user. It was probably easy-ish to build up the numbers you need to make it cost-effective. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, we kind of knew our numbers before. We weren't sure how much of that was going to translate to the center, whether some of that was going to stay at the hospital. And some of it does stay at the hospital. And there are other radiology groups in town that do Y90. But I would say it probably maintained about 80% of my referral pattern. And it actually works out great because I could do Y90s, I can do prostate embolizations, I can do knee embolization. So my practice is really embolization, which has just been awesome. Great. It's the best part. Right. So Charlie, do you do any cases in the hospital? I do about 5% of my cases in that hospital, Michael. And I, I would say that we're equipped to do most anything here in the OBL. Immunoembolization for ocular melanoma, hepatic metastases, we don't do here because we can't get the GMCSF. Uh, so I will do those in the hospital. If somebody has labile carcinoid disease, I'll do those procedures in the hospital. We treat neuroendocrine disease all the time in the OBL and pre-medicate them with uh, octreotide. But if somebody's known to be labile, I'd rather have that patient in the hospital in case something were to happen. So now back to OBL, I mean, to PAE. So, I mean, just to start, how is it different, if at all, doing a PAE in the OBL versus the hospital? I think it's much quicker to do a, a PAE in the OBL versus the hospital for the reasons that we discussed, kind of getting the patient in. That workflow is much quicker to bring them straight into the pre and post area that the patient here has the same nurse that follows them throughout the procedure, start an IV, get them in the, the room. That's usually... I would say 45 minutes to an hour, but we don't get bumped by other things. No. Again, having a dedicated staff that we do the same things over and over, they know what catheters we're going to use. We have pretty much standardized equipment, which helps everybody. So early on when we had BMIs of 32 or higher for a prostate embolization, we know that the, that milligray is going to creep up pretty quickly on a C-arm and it can creep up pretty quickly on a, a fixed unit as well. But the C-arm that we had would pretty much tap out at about 1,000 milligray. And as you know, if you're doing PAEs on big patients, you can burn through 500 milligray without even finishing a side. So, Charlie, I'm in South Louisiana. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hitting that within a matter of minutes. So we can do all of our patients here, regardless of BMI. So we definitely treat 35 to 40, 42 BMIs here. I'm not sure what your, your normal BMI is down there, but that's a fairly large, but I would say that all of those patients are treatable. Trick anatomy can sometimes bump up your milligray, but our typical procedure, our fluoro times are about 18 to 25 minutes of fluoro. For bilateral? Yes. That's great. And then we, our typical milligray dosing is about 300 to 600 milligray. And so we just kind of optimize the machine that you have. We tend to do spins on the internal iliac arteries. So we'll do three for 36, an injection in the internal with a six second delay. So that gives us a 3D model of whatever side we're working on. And then we use very little contrast after that. And that's dilute contrast. That's about two thirds contrast, one third saline. Once you start understanding how to use the models, you can really decrease dose to the patient yourself as well as limiting contrast. Man, that's great. Charlie, in terms of, I mean, you told me that a lot of the patients you get come from primary care or self-referred, but most of them have seen a urologist. What do you require for a patient before going to PAE in terms of workup, particularly from urology? That's a great question. And I always thought that patients had to have urodynamics and imaging and the full gamut of tests. And in reality, when patients are going for MIST, for minimally invasive surgical therapies by a urologist, many of them will just go with IPSS score, quality of life. They may or may not have urodynamics. They may or may not have a transrectal ultrasound. Now, when I see patients and, and they haven't 
had any of these studies done. Being a radiologist, maybe that's why I get an MRI. I give the patient the option because I think we should know what size gland we're treating. In the old days, they used to get MRI before and three months or six months after the PAE. In reality, what we're trying to do is make the patient feel better and follow IPSS and quality of life scores. But you're going to be the doctor managing some of these patients. Now, hopefully they have a primary care doctor that you can refer them back to. But I'll see patients, I'll put them on uh, Flomax if they haven't been on an alpha blocker and they want to do a trial because most insurance companies want to see a trial of an alpha blocker. Now, I'm in Colorado. There's a lot of people that don't want to take medicines at all. So I put that in my dictation. If they say, if I say the patient refuses to take medication due to the side effect profile, sometimes that will still get authorized to be treated. So most patients are, are going to, they're definitely going to have an IPSS quality of life. They may have urodynamic study. They may or may not have imaging. And then I think patients who are, have had longstanding kind of bladder dysfunction, people who have some neurogenic disorders that can cause bladder dysfunction, those patients, I would say, need urodynamic studies before moving forward. So you just send them to the urologist and say, okay, look, I need this patient to get Euroflow. Yes. And you know, they just go there and they come back. Okay. I would say that of these patients that need urodynamic studies for medical reasons, I refer those patients to the urologist. I do have a couple of urologists in towns that are that are PAE friendly, but I can tell you I've also referred patients back to urology for urodynamics and never saw them again. In terms of evaluating the the Euroflow, how do you decide from that? You know, you get the results. Somebody with with longstanding bladder issues who is not going to be a candidate, you know, may not improve from a PAE. Yeah. So low low pressure, low flow probably isn't going to improve from a PAE. So the bladder just can't contract well enough to get the urine out. If it's high pressure, low flow, meaning the bladder's trying to contract and you've got an outlet obstruction, that's usually related to BPH. There are some good studies. Actually, I think JVIR had a good article about urodynamics for the interventional radiologist. And it's not that difficult to understand. It's really just a, a flow over time issue. So the, the way it works for me, anytime I get a patient who does not have any imaging, and I get imaging on it. Those are always the ones that end up really small glands. And I'm, I'm curious how you approach those. If you have like a, a volume minimum, I mean, volume, yeah, volume minimum that you're willing to treat. How do you typically approach patients with glands on the relatively small side? So the studies would say that small glands respond as well as large glands. I don't know that that's true in my practice. I think when you're 25 to 30 gram gland, those are hard to find the arteries and challenging yeah. to treat. You also get about a cc of embolic in there before it goes to stasis. So small glands, I just make sure that they know what the options are. Now, okay. that's not to say I wouldn't treat them, but I would probably wouldn't quote a 90% success rate in a small gland. And there's TUIP. There, you know, there's different minimally invasive therapies that urology has that are less invasive than a TERP that may work well in a small gland. So I just want to make sure that they understand there are options and PAE might not be the best. Okay. So you've seen the patient in clinic and determined that he's a good candidate for a PAE. Let's talk about what the procedure day looks like for, for you and the patient. On an average day in your OBL, how many patients are you, are you typically trying to treat? I would say a busy day for us is three, probably more likely two. Maybe do, do one prostate in the morning, one prostate in the afternoon. And if we have a couple of uh, liver embolizations that we could put in between, that's a good day for me. In reality, I have to see patients uh, pre for consultation. I need to follow up patients after the procedure. So two in a day may seem a little bit weak to some people, but to me, it's kind of a good mix of doing procedures, seeing patients, and being able to focus on the patients that I am treating. Yeah. And every now and then you get one of those that's just a beast. And not having four more after that is a nice thing. So you're doing these with moderate sedation? We tend to use fentanyl and Versed. Every once in a while, we'll get a patient who doesn't want any sedation. And I discourage that. I just, you know, it's a long time to lay on a table for our average procedures time is about 90 minutes to get on the table to getting off the table. And they're just uncomfortable. So if they can at least take a little bit of fentanyl or Versed to take the edge off, that works better. Also, when we do these rotational spins, that three for 36 in the internal 
Some men just say, oh, it kind of feels warm and like I have to urinate. Other men are almost jumping off the table because it, it really does cause some cramping. And so I usually give a little bit of extra fentanyl right before we do those spins with the bigger injections. Are you doing the majority of these from radial or femoral access or does it vary? Michael, I'm old. <laughs> I do them from the groin. <laughs> Look, I'm a femoral guy too. I had, you know, when I was right out of fellowship and radial access was hot and I was I switched, I was doing all my fibroids from radial. And in the last year, I have switched to femoral for almost everything and I don't miss it. I just feel like you get really good at things you do over and over and over. And for us, it's the same base catheter. It's the same microcatheter. It's the same embolic. And that Cardivale prostate catheter with the 15 centimeter arm, it's a little shorter than a ruck. Yet it's pointed inward instead of outward. It's been a great base catheter for me. And it makes it easy to go up and over and treat the catheter lateral side, but also just push it back up and pull it straight down into the ipsilateral side. Oh, it's awesome. And it's a good, you have to form it. So you got to use a OmniFlush or something to get up and over. But it's been very helpful. Now, everybody has their own base catheters. And I know some people as you use C2 and Waltman Loop, and you just get good at what you do a bunch of. So you start with that and you know you form it, you get down. Do you start with the contralateral or the ipsilateral? Contra. So do you, you get in the internal and you do your spin? And then what do you do you know, in terms of finding the prostatic arteries from there? Yeah. So I'm fortunate. I've done this on C-arms and I've done it on advanced application. I would say that it is a bit more challenging to do it on a C-arm. You really need to know your anatomy. And I would say you end up selecting many more vessels on a C-arm just to make sure that that wasn't the prostate. Whereas what I do now is I just do the rotation. I sit down at the machine and and we actually have all of the capabilities in the room as we're sterile, as we had on the workstation. So I could just run through the images real quick. I'll do a 3D reconstruction based on that spin. And then I'll, on that 3D, where we actually pick out the artery that goes to the prostate and it will auto segment the internal iliac artery and it'll give us a GPS roadmap of where we need to go. And the beauty of that is it's tied to the gantry. So as I start to rotate the gantry, the model rotates overlying the patient. And a lot of times you're in a steep ipsilateral oblique to get into the prostate or the interdivision, but there's a lot of times you need to do that opposite oblique, which can be very challenging unless you're super selective. But when you have a 3D model, you can rotate that in any any direction, craniocaudal, lateral obliquity, to, to open up those vessels without having to do an injection every 10 degrees. So that allows us to select out the prostate artery. And then once we're in the artery, I do another quick spin and I do that at, depending on the vascular flow, I'll do usually 0.3 cc's per second for a total of three cc's. And I'll spin that at eight seconds. And that gives me a pretty good idea of what is the parenchymal blush of the vascular territory that I would treat from that embolization point. And if I just see prostate, then that'll trigger us to do the embolization on the left side. If there's some extra prostatic vasculature, seminal vesicles, bladder, other things, I would try to go a little bit deeper. Although I think that we probably get non-target embolization to those areas, not infrequently. And we know that's that's why 7% of patients have hematuria, blood in the stool, hematospermia, all self-limiting. Right. Absolutely. So uh, what you, you told me your, your preferred base catheter, what microcatheter are you typically using? So I'm a little spoiled. I use uh, Swift Ninja. Yeah. And honestly, I think most of these microcatheters are, are great for prostate embolization. I would say that we tend to be going smaller with the prostate catheters. And probably 2729, those are too big for prostate embolization. I think mm-hmm. we're probably more in the 2.4 to 2.0. I tend to like either deflectable microcatheters or at least an angled microcatheter. And the reason for that is I think that they track a little bit better. Sometimes those straight microcatheters want to prolapse down the, the parent vessel. Right. And uh, that's just been my practice. But that's the art of the whole thing is figuring out what you can do with it, with and without a wire and what catheter works best for you. Once you get in and you've done your cone beam and, and you're happy with it, what are you using for your embolic? So I use embozine and I, I start with 250 micron beads and we we dilute those beads to manufacturer specifications. 
I like the Embozine just because it's a very tightly calibrated product. And I also like it because it's colored. And you'd be amazed the cross-contamination that you see in your syringe or on the table with a colored product. I think it makes you much more vigilant about being careful not to contaminate with beads areas that you don't want. Sometimes as you're injecting and you actually fill up that prostate artery with beads and there's no more forward flow and you still have a microcatheter loaded with beads, as you draw that blood back into the syringe, you can see the beads actually coming up to a point where there are no beads left and it's all blood. And you feel at that point, it's either okay to, to do an injection with contrast and just show that you're at stasis or just remove the catheter in total. And Michael, I would say we, we start with 250 micron embozine, and I'll do that for a couple of cc's, usually about two cc's. And then I switch to 400 micron, just thinking that we're getting the 250 micron embozine deep in the gland. And then we're kind of filling it up to the periphery of the gland with the 400 micron embozine. And I think just as a rule, we try to get about one cc of embolic per 10 cc's of gland. So if you're treating a 60 gram gland, you'd like to get about six cc's, not six cc's on each good. side, but six cc's in total. That's pretty good. And I, and I think you want to make sure that you're embolizing super slow and dilute. It's not quite like a, a liver embolization. I think this vascular bed is very s small and you want to just kind of dribble them in there and you don't want to get proximal aggregation. You want to take advantage of the calibrated size and let it get deep into the gland and blockade the way back, but not not from clumping. Yeah. Do you do like perfected technique? Do you go distally after? Or do you just, from where you are, do your complete embolization? I would say that we do perfected maybe 25 to 40% of the time. If it seems reasonable, I'll try and push that microcatheter a bit deeper in, especially if we're in the median lobe. I think you have to be careful with perfected or any kind of pressure-directed therapy because you can open up intraprostatic collaterals that then flow outside of the prostate. So again, you know, you want to be make sure that you're looking at the pubis and below and that when you're pressurizing the system, you're not spilling into vessels that are going outside of the prostate, especially to the penis. How do you check for that during your embolization? Are you just looking for it when you're injecting the particles or do you do the occasional run or, or injection during your embolization? So usually it's just during the embolization and I do it on a negative roadmap just to be able to really see. I think it gives you a little bit better contrast between background tissue. If I can't see exactly what's going on, I will do a DSA run because I think sometimes it's hard to see on fluoroscopy. Always looking for extra prostatic branches. Okay. So, you know, you've treated, let's say you treated the contralateral side, you treated the left and you finish your embolization. So how do you get in on the right? I haven't used this catheter. Is it just, you know, you just pull it straight down or do you form a loop? So the, uh, the catheter has a, a long arm. It's got a 15 centimeter arm on it. That's why it's called a CPC 15. We can go back to the original aortic run just by pushing one button. So we don't have to inject any more new contrast. It remembers that table position and it overlays that DSA image. So with the CPC 15, you can push that catheter back up into the aorta like you can a ruck, twist it towards you, pull it down, and engage usually the internal iliac. Sometimes I'll use our microcatheter and wire to engage the internal and then pull that CPC-15 down over it, kind of using it as a guide wire, and then just repeat the procedure on the right side. Same way. And what I didn't ask you for the, the left side is, is what's your endpoint? My endpoint, I would say, is true stasis. Uh, I want to make sure that there's not antegrade flow. And it may take a little while. You may want to wait a minute after your your last 1cc embolization. And when you embolize these, a cc usually goes in over a minute. So it is a very kind of slow 0 0.1, 0 0.1 embolization. But I'm looking for stasis. And at the end of the embolization, I'll either give a little bit of extra beads as I pull back the microcatheter as long as I think that's safe. I may give gel foam, slurry, or I may use a small coil on the way out. Okay. So you're finished with the case. Do you do a closure device or do manual compression? I use a closure device. And I think that it gets the patient out of there a little bit quicker. Whatever your closure device of choice is, you get very good at one or two devices. And I, I tend to use star close just because that's what I'm comfortable with. But the patients are discharged one hour after the procedure. 
they have to urinate before they leave. It's pretty uncommon to have men go into retention, especially within the hour after the procedure, but we're prepared to put Foley's in. If you had to put a Foley in a patient for urinary retention, I'd keep it in for at least a week and then have them come back to your clinic, remove it, and make sure that they're doing okay. Charlie, do you get any patients as you're treated that are, that are catheter dependent already? That's a minority of our patients uh, that come in with a Foley catheter. There definitely have been men that have had urinary retention in the past requiring a Foley. We're probably looking at about 5% of our patients that come in with a, an existing Foley catheter. But those are mostly home runs. I mean, those patients do very well. They do have urinary symptoms. You wouldn't think that they would, but after a prostate embolization, they do have that cramping abdominal discomfort. We give them pyridium, even though the urethra is really kind of protected by the Foley and oxybutynin, and that seems to help them. But And then we'll bring them back to clinic about two weeks after the embolization and try and do a Foley removal, a void test. And if that doesn't work, we'll bring them up back weekly after that, depending if they live close by. Some patients come in from hours away, and we may just test them every two weeks. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be my question. How long? For your non catheter dependent patients, you're sitting at home after an hour. What, what do you typically send patients home with medication-wise? I send them home with five medications, and I give them just a prophylactic antibiotic. I used to use Bactrim, but there's a fair amount of patients that have sulfa allergies, so we switch to Macrobid, and I just give them three days. We don't see as many UTIs as we did when we were putting Foley's in, but I would say we haven't put Foley's in patients in the last 600 patients. You know, It's just we don't do that anymore. We give them a steroid dose pack, just a five-day Medrol dose pack. We give them steroids during the procedure, unless they're diabetic. They have them start the dose pack the next day. I think that helps with some of this frequency, urgency. And as we know, and whenever we embolize an organ, you're definitely going to get some edema before it starts to shrink. Oxybutynin it helps with bladder spasms, so we'll use that. And they take that more preventatively. So I would suggest that they take that medication Pyridium numbs up the urothelium. And as you know, most of these guys are complaining of frequency, urgency, and dysuria. Tends to last a couple days after the procedure, definitely less than a week. But I think these medications all help with that. I do give them oxycodone. I just give them 12 pills because some men really do need it. And it's hard to call that in after hours. And then ibuprofen. I mean, I think ibuprofen works great. Now, if they have renal insufficiency, I wouldn't give them ibuprofen. I'd just give them the steroids. If they're a diabetic, I may just give them the ibuprofen and not the steroids. So we tailor it to the individual. And if they've had significant urinary retention in the past, you may not want to give them oxybutynin because it could put them into retention. Okay. So if your average patient didn't have to go home with a catheter, didn't have a catheter in the first place, when do you tend to see him back? I see him back in a month. The nurses will call them the next day to make sure they're doing okay. I give all my patients my cell phone, and, and you would think you'd get a bunch of phone calls, but you really don't. I, I would say that it's uncommon, and I'm prepared to meet them back at the hospital or wherever we need to to take care of them. Exceedingly uncommon. Yeah, I give mine out to a lot of my patients as well, and I think people are really worried about giving their cell phone there to get blown up. I found that my patients are are very respectful of that. You know, you give it to them, they take it seriously, they don't bug you. I actually tend to just have them text me and let me know how they're doing and obviously call me if they need me, but knock on wood, I've, I've had pretty good experiences giving that out. Yeah. So I think that when we talk about the AUA guidelines and the 2023 amendment, what is this going to do to our practice? I think it's probably going to increase the patient load, the the number of patients that we see. I think we're hopefully get increased referrals from the urologists. I think these silent sufferers at home are going to start hearing about this new procedure. And I think that the numbers of patients that we're going to be treating are going to increase over the next, I don't know, five or 10 years. The question is, do we have enough interventional radiologists to treat all these patients? <laughs> and how do we train up the IRs to do these procedures? I'm not sure that I have the answer to that, but I think some of these conferences like STREAM and SUR and CIRCE, you can learn from those. I think there's nothing like hands-on training. And actually, the simulators have gotten very good over time. I think it's going to take people that are really invested in prostate embolization, not just to dabble in it, because I think we know that what happens is that you probably don't get the outcomes that you're looking for. You're probably not spending the time that you need to spend with that patient in the procedure. 
and you're probably not identifying all the arteries that you need to. So I think the IRs that are going to be involved in this, they need to be dedicated to it like you would be dedicated to liver-directed therapy. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that's a challenge for a lot of the people that want to start doing prostatic artery embolization, and it very much was for me when I started. I was really motivated to take this on, and I had a really hard time getting patients on my table. And so when I started, I might get one every three to six months. And what you need for this is reps. And the anatomy is really challenging, and it it takes a while to see these patterns. And especially with my first cases, I, I really struggled to understand the anatomy and my, my doses were really high. I was using a ton of contrast. And and I think a lot of people have that problem is getting enough volume to to really be comfortable. I totally agree with that. I think one thing that made my life easier was that Carnivale classification paper that really broke down the prostate arteries into type one through type four. And that covered 95% of the prostate origins. So honestly, before that, as I was doing these procedures, I was just kind of fumbling, trying to get into arteries and inject them and get into what I thought looked like a prostate artery. But if you know that there's type 1 coming off the umbilical, type 2 coming off the interdivision, type 3 coming off the obturator, type 4 coming off internal pedendal, then there's there's a very high, high probability that you're going to find the prostate artery within a very small amount of anatomy. So I think instead of fumbling around, I would read the papers. I would understand what the common origins are. And I think that will help everybody along the way. Yeah, it certainly helped for me. I've, I've studied those papers back and forth. Okay. Charlie, I got another question for you that we can cut this if we need to, but I, I'm looking at this thing you tweeted yesterday, the PAE with ABK, easy view, radio pay. What is that? You got to tell me about this. That looks so cool. So ABK is a relatively new company that makes radio opaque beads, and they're uh, they're also in the Y90 space right now. So what I'm using is just their non-radioactive radio opaque beads, and they're a proprietary polymer that you can see under X-ray guidance. You can see as you're infusing the beads, so you don't need to use contrast, although we do mix them with contrast. And there's different sizes. I was using the 150 micron beads. And you can see the deposition. So after the whole procedure is done and the contrast is washed out, we do a cone beam to make sure that there's complete coverage of the gland. Is it ready for prime time? No. We're, we're working through some research with ABK to see if this could serve as radio opaque bead in the treatment of prostate embolization. We can cut this. I just had to ask you about it's it. It's pretty the pictures cool. Are amazing. I mean, yeah. It's super neat because you can, you can watch the gland fill up and at the end... Because as you know, if you do a bunch of these, it's not that it's one prostate artery on each side. Sometimes there's right. two or three on each side. So if I saw that I was missing a quarter of the gland, I'd go back and I'd look for that other vessel. Right. All right, Charlie, that's about all I got. What else am I missing that's relevant to doing you know, PAE in the OBL? I think for people that are that want to do PAE in the OBL, I'd probably cut my teeth on it in the hospital if you have that opportunity. So if you can, if you can treat your first 10 or 20 patients on a machine, maybe a fixed unit that has navigation capabilities and cone beam, I think that would serve you well. And then take those skills that you've learned in the hospital and, and migrate them into the OBL. You can start doing these in the OBL. I think it's very safe. It just may take you a little bit longer to identify the vessels, especially if you don't have a breadth of knowledge of doing a couple hundred cases. And I think it makes sense to do them at first in the hospital where you're in an environment where you may not necessarily have as many cost considerations. And it, it's not something you're going to have to think about using four different catheters when you're learning early on and, and using a few coils here and there. I think that's good advice. Yeah, I think that's accurate. And you figure out what is your workflow, what catheters work for you. Now, I can tell you that when we're in the middle of a procedure, cost is irrelevant. If I need a different wire, if I need a smaller embolic, if I need something other than a Swift Ninja, then I'll pull that off the shelf. The reason I use Swift Ninja is it's very uncommon to switch from Swift Ninja to another catheter. In my experience, it was pretty common for me to have a low threshold if I was using a curved or a straight microcatheter and I couldn't get in, I'd get frustrated. I'm like, just give me the Swift Ninja. So yeah. that's become my default catheter. It's more expensive. That makes a lot of sense. It, yeah, it's more expensive, but you're not going to use a few catheters before you open it. 
I like that. All right. Well, Charlie, that's all I got. I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your expertise. And you might find me coming and uh, try to do one of your demo courses through Varian. <laughs> Very good. Well, I appreciate you and your time, Michael. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Roy Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 